just recently uh, Mount Etna has been erupting hasn't it and what an awesome sight that would have been uh, to see uh, Mount Etna or you be close to its vicinity quite an awesome sight of a natural phenomena of nature as it were erupting like that but this what is happening on Mount Sinai, Sinai is no uh, natural uh, phenomena what is going on God has spoken his ten words and this moment ends as it began uh, sandwiched in between uh, the ten words is this majestic presence of theophany of God manifested before the people with thunder and flashes of lightning, sounds of trumpet blasts. The mountain is wrapped in smoke. We see this awesome presence. Exodus 20, 18 ends as it started in Exodus 19, 16 to 19. Of course, more covenant obligations are to come in regard to the worship and civic laws in the land of Israel. But these ten commandments are clearly standalone, spoken words of God, written on stone tablets with the finger of God. And here we see the awesome impact and effects of God's presence and his spoken word from heaven to the people. He's spoken those commandments to have no other gods before him, to have no idols, to honour his name, to remember the Sabbath, to honour their parents, not to murder, not to commit adultery, not to steal, not to bear false witness, not to covet. And it's at this juncture now we hear Israel's and Moses' response to it. They fear and they tremble and they draw away from the glory of God. Before God had set boundaries at the basement of Mount Sinai and they were to draw to the boundaries. But now they draw away once again. After hearing the voice of God and seeing the div divine majesty of God. Some commentators say it was probably about 12 miles away back to their tents. See, in Deuteronomy, they were at their tents. They were fearful. Why? Why were they so fearful? Why did they tremble? God had come down. God had spoken. Wouldn't you be fearful? Wouldn't you tremble? It impacts their five senses, doesn't it? They heard the thunder. They see the lightning blasts, lightning, the fireballs they were. Something that happened when the Abrahamic covenant was given, the uh, lightning and the, the fireballs and the thunder uh, was present. And the behold, there's a cloud of smoke, thick darkness. They could have felt it, touched it, seen it, heard it. It impacted their whole senses. As Phil Collins wrote, I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh Lord, that's a humorous thing, but in all seriousness, that is what they could feel. That's what they could see. That's what they could hear. That's what they could touch. The presence of God was so heavy. His divine weight. In fact, it impacted their minds and bodies. The people were afraid and they trembled. Their knees were knocking. It impacted every part of them. Their whole being at the sight before them. Of what they had heard... And what they were experiencing. Is holiness. God is transcendent. He is set apart. He's not relating to the worldly and temporal. He is absolute of moral perfection. His holiness is his weight. 
He is on his own. And yet here they hear this transcendent and holy God speak from heaven. And they're going to be physically impacted by that. Because they are unholy creatures. Because there is a a creator-creature distinction. Consider Isaiah's uh, senses in his vision of, of the Lord. In the year of King Uzziah, when he, what he saw and heard and felt, and he knew in his own mind and experience. And what did he do? He fell to the ground and he said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of unclean people. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. We see in the incarnation of Jesus The one is truly God and truly man that in hypostatic union yet whose majestic presence is veiled. So that we can encounter him. And he came and brought the word of the father to the people. That majestic presence that Jesus shares in the glory that he had with the Father before the world existed. He incarnated and came down. He descended. This great God of ours, our Lord Jesus, came from the Father to reveal the Father to us. To do the Father's will. And consider the glimpses of that divine, majestic presence of our Lord Jesus and its effects upon others around him. On that fishing trip when the disciples had been fishing all night in Luke 5. And Jesus tells them to push out on the boats, to go out and drop down the nets. And they catch such a a huge uh, amount of fish that the nets are bursting, the ship is sinking... And Peter falls down and says, away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Before the divine presence. Something he got a glimpse of his glory in this divine miracle that took place. They were terrified. They were terrified. We're on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James and John. Here again, their five senses are overloaded. Their minds cannot compute the data before them truly. They encounter the majestic presence. A bright cloud overshadowed them. Overshadowed them. A voice from heaven speaks to them. Affirming the divine sonship. Jesus is transfigured. Moses and Elijah shone. What is the creaturely response to this majestic presence breaking into the ordinary? They fell on their faces, verse 6, and they were terrified. Matthew 17, 6. They were terrified. Yes, they may, oh, let's make tabernacles. They were terrified. The Apostle John in his vision on the island of Patmos when he, was, he saw the Lord, the, the Son of Man in all his glory and power and majesty. And he fell down as though dead. Would you not tremble in his God's glorious presence? Will we tremble in God's glorious presence? Israel was afraid and trembled and they stood far off. That the apostles were at times afraid and trembled as they encountered glimpses of his majestic presence. But Moses, here we see, reassures Israel. And the truth be told, one greater than Moses reassures us that we do not need to fear. That we don't need to stand far off. That we can draw near. Because of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has descended 
He has placed his hand upon us as he did on each of those occasions, whether that was Isaiah, whether it was Peter or whether it was John. He puts his right hand upon them and he says, fear not. As Isaiah's sin was atoned for, by, with hot coal, so our sin is atoned for. Through our Lord Jesus, through his blood and righteousness. Indeed, like Peter, our sinful state is so clearly visible. The more we come closer to our Lord, the more we see our sinful state and we fall down before him. For he places his hand upon us. And he calls us to serve him. And as he called Peter, James and John to stand and arise. And he said don't speak of this to anybody until the son of man has risen. So he places his hand upon us and he tells us to go and speak of his glory. Of his majesty. Of his sonship. Of his life, death and resurrection. And we speak, to, speak of him to this very day. For Christ has risen. We see in Christ that, that uh, reading in Hebrews 12. In Christ we come to that kingdom that cannot be shaken. A superior covenant than the Mosaic covenant. Moses himself was even fearful later. Although before he desired to draw into God's presence and see his glory. He delighted in it. In Deuteronomy 9.19 Moses was fearful himself. But our Lord Jesus is far greater and superior. We must draw near, but we don't draw near flippantly, do we? We draw near in reverent fear and trembling because the Lord Jesus Christ revealed God's majestic presence. He is the one who fulfilled God's law, atoned for our sins and rose for our justification. And then we should fear not, for he is the first and the last, the living one. He died and behold, he's alive forevermore. And as a consequence, we should offer those, offer our lives as acceptable worship. We should come with acceptable worship, with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. It wouldn't be long later that they would make an idol. And they would worship God in an unacceptable way. We need to remember to have reverent fear for God. They feared God's word. Verse 19, let not God speak to us lest we die, they tell Moses. It's not only the divine presence they are fearful of, but also the divine spoken word of God that they are fearful of. They've just heard God audibly speaking from the mountaintop. Why are they fearful of God's word? This is a new revelation of God's moral law to them. But also part of the Mosaic Covenant given by God. Later written on the stone tablets. But even before this they're fearful because this law was written eternally upon their hearts. Long before it was externally received. We know that don't we in Romans speaking of the Gentiles in Romans 2.15. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. While their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them. Why are they fearful? Because they are conscious of sin. They have just heard the ten spoken words of God. What man or woman can stand before that and say, tickety-boo, all's good with me. No. In Deuteronomy it tells us, don't they? If we hear any more, we're going to die. We're going to explode. They're fearful of what they have heard from God. The exacting demands of the law. They become conscious clearly of, of their own sin. 
Romans 3, 19 to 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable God to God, for by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. They've heard God's word and they are fearful and trembling. Even though they go on and say, oh, all the Lord will do, we will do. That's a lie. They cannot. Yes, there is a reverent fear for the word. Exodus 19, 18, 24-7 at the bookends of the giving of the law, of the moral law. And then the, mosaic, the extended Mosaic covenant with the civil and ceremonial and so on. All the commands he gives, we will do. After showing his glory and greatness, after the giving of the law, there is a reverent fear. For God has spoken. There's a desire among God's people. A desire to hear and to do it. And so often among us as well, there's a desire to hear and to do it. But by it we also become conscious of sin. And also there's an awareness that we fail and we don't do it. But we have a, a mediator. We have grace. We have Christ who fulfilled that for us. He is our righteousness. He is the end of the law. There is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Now we can delight in the law. It didn't go well for Israel. They broke what they said. For look what the Lord says in Deuteronomy 5.29 in regard to their statement. Oh that they had such a heart as this always. To fear me and to keep all my commandments. That it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. It didn't go well. We can't keep God's commandments. They went into idolatry. Galatians 2.16 Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law but through faith in Jesus Christ. We've had this in our Bible study haven't we? No man will be justified by works of the law, rather through faith in Jesus Christ. So the law's intent, Galatians 3.24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So the law has a positive function of highlighting sin, restraining transgressors and foretelling Christ. The law keeper. We see, secondly, here, Moses mediated, didn't he? he? He drew himself near to the glory of God. He was the mediator between God, as it were, and, and the people. Verse 20, Exodus 20, Moses said to the people, he comes to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be for you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off. While Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Mo Moses couldn't draw the people to God. Not like Christ. Moses drew himself near to God. Christ draws his people to God. The people ask Moses to take on that role of mediation between these two parties. And he reassures them. And as they stood far off, he goes into the thick darkness where God was. Moses was a man, Exodus 33, 18. He desired to see God's glory. But ultimately, he is not the man who draws people into God's presence. It is Christ who draws people into God's presence. Old Testament believers and New Testament believers. Those who have faith in the promised Messiah. The promised mediator. 
The prophet greater than Moses, who he himself said would be raised up. But Israel are reassured, Moses' mediation with Israel. Do not fear, he said. God has good intent for them. They are not to fear. With a slavish fear or dread, the Lord has redeemed Israel out of Egypt. He has protected and provided for them. He has promises, covenantal promises to them. Embedded in the Abrahamic covenant is Christ for them, their mediator. They're fearful probably because, you know, the the thunder and the lightning, the trumpet blast, the thick smoke. It reminded them of the judgment plagues that fell upon Egypt. For instance, the hail which came with uh, these signs. It terrified Pharaoh and his people and brought judgment upon them. Be not afraid, says Moses, you will not be consumed by them. You will not die by the hand of God at his presence through hearing his thunderous voice and the words spoken to you. Be of good courage. God's design is not to destroy you, but to preserve you. To protect you. To guide you. To have you rule. To have you sit under his rule. He kept his covenant promises to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And he redeemed his people. And he promised them a land. He promised them a a kingdom. And he promised them a saviour and lord. Who would redeem them. Christ. And those who look to him in faith will be saved. The testing here is clear. We are always saying, make me your king. Obey this law. Submit and serve under my rule. In this land. And all the Lord has spoken, they said, we will do. But now is the time of testing as well, isn't it, for them. He made known their law, he had given to Israel, and so they were now to prove yourselves. That's what Abraham sa- uh, to Moses says, doesn't he, there? And so Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not lie. Moses said to people, do not fear, for God has come to test you. God has come to test you. Do you truly love God? Follow the first table of law. Do you truly love your neighbour? Follow the second table of law. Israel's fear of walking in God's ways now must be proven. It must be evidence fleshed out before God. God wants you, Moses, to say, not merely talk the talk, but walk the walk. Live a life of reverent fear to the glory of God. Have a serious regard to his commands. Be careful to observe them and walk in his ways. Why? He tells them, doesn't he, in that verse? Well, that you may not sin. That you may not sin. And they say, all that we have heard, we will do. But Israel had fallen short. Deuteronomy 5, 28. The Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of his people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. But he knew their hearts, didn't he? He knew what would happen. In verse 29, all that they had such a heart as this always to fear me. Only by receiving that new heart, that heart of flesh, of that law written upon our hearts, a spirit within, the promise of the new covenant, not the Mosaic covenant. Only in that root will that be possible. Through faith. That it might go well with them and their descendants forever. We can't, do we? For all have sinned. 
and fall short of the glory of God. No one declared righteous by fulfilling and obeying the law. Even Moses himself wasn't perfect. He too fell short in his talk and walk with God and fell short of God's glory. And yet he was looking to a greater mediator than himself. And that brings us finally, look, Jesus mediated and drew all who believe near to God. In Jesus, we have that superior mediator. Jesus Christ was a man like Moses, born under the law, in order to redeem those under the law. Galatians 4, 4, 5. He was also the one who delighted to do the Lord's will. And that law was written upon his heart. And he fulfilled the law in every respect. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't abolish the law from us. He fulfilled it. He is our righteousness. Now he calls us to walk as he walked. The law has no condemnation upon us because of Christ Jesus. He was tested and proven. He fulfilled what Israel failed as a son to do in keeping the requirements of God's law. No wonder the Lord on that holy mount, as Jesus was transfigured, I believe it might have been there or at his baptism, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. He was well pleased. His heart and intent was on God's will and God's law. And he came to mediate between man and God. He fulfilled everything, didn't he? In him, Romans 3, 21 to 22, but now a righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For he paid the penalty of the law. He died for our sins. He who knew no sin became sin. He who never broke God's law but fulfilled it became the lawbreaker that we might become the righteousness of God. He bore the curse of the law on that cursed tree. The fact of the matter that by the law no man can keep that perfectly. We need Christ who is our mediator who is the atoning sacrifice? Who is the paschal lamb that dies for us? Who is the scapegoat? Who is the one who draws into God's presence and came from God's presence and draws his people with him into God's presence? Ultimately, the law drives us to Jesus. Jesus forgives. Jesus gives a new heart, puts a new spirit within us and empowers us to live and delight in the law because there's no condemnation in the law. The law is good and it benefits us and it addresses us and leads us to Christ. That condemnation has been removed. For we have been crucified with Christ. We're dead. We're no longer under the law. We're in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Righteousness is imputed and manifested. And that life I now live, says the apostle, in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And because of him, we can delight and uphold God's law. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Because we're not condemned by it. We delight in it. 
Therefore, our righteousness, our hope and our power doesn't come from our law keeping, our piety, but through our mediator's law keeping, his perfect righteousness, his sacrificial death, his atoning blood and his glorious resurrection. He lived a life that we could not live. He died the death we should have died and he rose again, proving that we might live a life that is justified through faith. In Jesus Christ. And not by works of the law. And that as Augustus top lady. In the second stanza wrote. Not the labours of my hands. Can fulfil the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know. Could my tears forever flow. All for sin could not atone. Thou must save. And thou alone. Jesus saves us through his blood and righteousness as a mediator. He hasn't just drawn himself to the Father. He has drawn us all who believe in Christ Jesus into the heavenly place, into the most holy of Zion. We worship with the angels of God above. Not just in the future, but presently. We reign with Christ. So in closing, if you're not a Christian this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're trusting in yourselves, your own works, your own morality, your own uh, worldview, your own law, or even trying to keep God's law and his commandments, you can't. You should fear and tremble. For our God is a consuming fire. Holy. He will bring judgment. Be assured. By the works of the law. No flesh will be justified. There is one mediator between man and God. The man Christ Jesus. In him. You can be declared to be justified. You can receive his perfect righteousness. Through faith alone. There is, no, there is no other mediator. There is no other way. He kept the Lord's commands perfectly. He died for those who broke them. And he rose again that we might live. And he can take us into God's glorious presence. Won't you trust in him? Won't you come to him today? Can you not hear him roar? Can you not hear him plead? And Christian, let us rejoice, for we have a Saviour who lived and died for us, and by his free grace has empowered us to believe, has made us a new creation. In order that we can come and draw near to God and he can draw near to us. And we come in reverent fear and we worship him. And we serve him. Loving God and loving our neighbour. Drawing closer to the heavenly Zion. To the glory of God. Amen.